Hello, I'm Bill Sawicki, Managing Editor of Healthcare IT News, a publication of Hims Media. Welcome to today's webinar. Technology environments in healthcare are becoming increasingly heterogeneous as a result of M&A activity, organic growth, and a desire to reap the benefits of best-of-breed solutions. With the increasing volume of electronic data in healthcare, provider organizations will need game-changing technology in identity governance to proactively address high-risk access before a breach occurs. To evaluate the current challenges with identity management in healthcare and how artificial intelligence might change the equation, Hims Media and SailPoint recently conducted a joint survey among cybersecurity decision makers and leaders at U.S. hospitals and health systems. Our speakers today will draw on results from this research in today's discussion. Let's introduce today's speakers. I'll start with Gianni Aiello. Gianni is the Director of Shared Services at SailPoint where his focus is on taking identity governance to a whole new level with the infusion of artificial intelligence and machine learning. Welcome, Gianni. Also joining, us, also, also joining us is Janet King. Janet is the Senior Director of Market Insights at Hims Media. In her role, Janet is tasked with conducting research to help healthcare organizations better understand key technology trends. Hello, Janet. Hi, Bill. Welcome, everyone. And now I'll turn it over to Janet to get us started. Thanks, Bill, and uh, thanks for joining us today. I'm, I'm looking forward to a lively discussion with you, Gianni. Yes, yeah, same here, Janet. Before looking we... forward to it as well. Yeah, great. Well, before we dig into the results, I'd like to just start by providing a brief overview of the research that Bill referenced at the start of today's webinar. And, and this, again, was research that we conducted in partnership with you at SailPoint. And it was an online survey that we conducted in May of this year um, among U.S. hospitals and health systems to better understand how healthcare providers are approaching identity management and to help assess opportunities for artificial intelligence-enabled identity solutions. So to that end, we surveyed a total of 104 respondents, all of whom had some level of involvement with cybersecurity initiatives at their organizations. And you can see from this slide a little bit on, on kind of who those 104 uh, decision makers were. Um, or are, um, they're employed in a mix of acute care settings. We had about half that came from multi-hospital systems and integrated delivery networks. And the balance were from uh, academic medical centers, standalone hospitals, uh, specialty hospitals, or other acute care facilities. You can see we had nearly an equal split by organization size with just under 50% responding from hospitals and health systems with more than 500 beds. And again, while all of those respondents were involved or are involved with cybersecurity, uh, you can see that the decision makers and influencers include those in IT roles as well as those in business and clinical roles. And to that last point, I think it's interesting to note that while IT professionals play a very prominent role in all types of decisions related to cybersecurity, those business and clinical leaders are also broadly involved, especially as influencers of cybersecurity purchase decisions, as well as recommenders and approvers of those purchases. So business decision makers in particular uh, play an equally prominent role along with IT. So if you look at that sort of blue and orange bars on this chart, um, you can see that they play um, a fairly equal role in setting IT uh, or setting cybersecurity priorities and budgets. And, you know, this basic broadening of the buyer collective for technology solutions beyond the IT suite is something that we're seeing across most U.S. hospitals and health systems today where we know from other research that we've done that the average buying team in those settings includes anywhere from 9 to 12 people in a variety of different roles. 
So while IT is still a very primary player in these decisions, um, they are more often collaborating with stakeholders across the organization for technology, and, and cybersecurity is certainly no exception there. So Gianni, does this expansion of cybersecurity influencers beyond those in what we would consider more traditional IT roles surprise you at all? No, not really, Janet. It's it's been one of the themes that I've noticed in my seven years at Sailpoint. To be quite honest, when I when I look back when I first joined the, the organization uh, and the types of engagements that we had back then and conversations we would have, it was very centered around the IT and security teams. Um, what I think's fundamentally started to change, while well, well, this change has been going on for a while, it's been going on for 10, 15 years, has been this digital transformation, digital transformation of of providers and, and the healthcare industry as a whole. And because of that, and because of that need, um, we're seeing that the business has to and wants to get more involved in not just the rollout of, of certain uh, front-end technologies that drive sort of the day-to-day -day clinical practices, but also because they have to incorporate security practices into things, they want some saying that. And so we see that with uh, the expansion in the conversations that I have. I speak a lot with um, healthcare managers and professionals, the people that are on uh, sort of in day-to-day -day situations uh, looking to understand how they can better gain access to certain applications and, and they care and, and they want to be involved in that process. So it doesn't surprise me. There's definitely been a shift given just the nature of that uh, digital transformation that's occurring today. Yeah, I totally agree. And having that broader team perspective is so critical to successfully, you know, driving the adoption of those initiatives as well. And, and if you look at identity management specifically, um, we see some interesting stuff. So we, we know from the 2019 HIMSS Cybersecurity Survey uh, that was just released um, earlier in the year, eight out of 10 hospitals, or 82%, have reported a significant security incident in the past 12 months. So that's a, you know, that's, a, that's a pretty high number, and with so much at stake, it's not terribly surprising to me then that the majority of hospitals and health systems, again, it was about eight out of 10 that we surveyed, are acknowledging that identity management is a critical or high priority. So there's a lot at stake from a cybersecurity perspective, and identity management is right up there on that list. In fact, only about 3% said it wasn't a priority at all. So Gianni, that certainly seems to signal a a nearly universal commitment to identity management by healthcare provider, which I think is, is very good news. But can you comment on the role identity management in particular plays within a holistic approach to cybersecurity and maybe speak a little bit about why it's critical to helping hospitals reduce or mitigate their security risks? Yeah, I think identity management has gone through a, a relatively interesting evolution over time of what it's really represented to organizations. I think if you go back 10, 15 years, I think as a market, it was very focused on IT operations and efficiencies and how can we increase the speed in which the IT team can manage the, the, the complex nature of application onboarding and, and people joining and moving or leaving the organization. I think what we've seen is that as cybersecurity has grown in its, in its context and its understanding of what happens out there, and as we've moved away from this focus on network security and, and, and sort of prevention of, of allowing people into the network to an understanding that it's, security is much broader than that. It, it, it evolves around not just that is still critical, but it also involves the people that are involved in uh, the organization. And we have to better understand their access and their ability to um, potentially be a, a attacked in some ways from, a, from, from phishing and various other, other mechanisms it's sort of come to the fore that there's a lot of context that identity management brings into helping you understand that. And so um, we definitely see, we've seen this change. Um, you know, when I first joined the company, as I said, seven years ago, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have thought we would have got this level of response. Um, it would probably have been maybe half this. I think as we've seen the, the evolution of breaches, as we've seen that it's not always as simple as just preventing someone from getting in, but there are accounts out there that maybe have too much privilege on them or, um, someone gets compromised based on some, some phishing attack, you have to start to better understand the profiles of individuals within your organization. And identity management, that's what it does. It's, it's the, the whole purpose of it is to, to solve that problem. 
And it's interesting because, you know, you're seeing that kind of universal commitment to identity management, but for larger providers, and, and these are providers that we're defining as those with more than 500 beds, um, 9 out of 10 are telling us that they are likely to prioritize identity management. That's, that's a significant difference compared to the 75%, which is still high, but, um, you know, with 500 or fewer beds. So what do you think might be driving that difference, Gianni, between, you know, the higher level of commitment among those uh, largest hospitals and health systems? I think it's uh, it's pretty simply to do with um, scale. Uh, I think as you look at more complex and larger organizations, that they really don't have a choice but to look at these types of technologies to solve these problems. And, and the two drivers that drive that are it becomes incredibly expensive to use rudimentary and basic tooling such as you know spreadsheets or just lots of manual provisioning where you have a lot of people that are having to go and manage the account edit, create an update process and delete process. It just doesn't scale well when you have to keep finding people to do that work. As well as it's just inherently um, more problematic as you as you start to look at the complexity of applications that get come into play as well. L larger organizations are going to tend to employ more applications and more more technologies to solve their day-to-day -day as their scale challenges grow. So not only do you have just more individuals, you have the complexity on the application side as well. So I think it's just natural scale that drives this need. But I will say that I actually think that that 75% number on the, on the small end is also a pretty significant shift uh, to where we were once again five, ten years ago. I think as more focus has been put on uh, regulatory needs such as HIPAA and um, other focuses, even smaller organizations are having to deal with this. And that 75% number is not insignificant because I honestly would have, would have thought that the number might have looked something like 40%, 50% five, ten years ago. So there's, there's a huge shift there as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think as you pointed out in the beginning, you know, also tied to the increase in digital health initiatives um, and sort of just the way that's changing the nature of, you know, their application and IT portfolios, right, and the kinds of initiatives that they're uh, tasked with managing. So we're, so we're seeing, yeah. you know, some good progress there, as you point out, right? Identity management seems to be firmly on the radar. Um, for U.S. hospitals and health systems today, which is which is great, and as you noted, you know you you expect that that's a pretty significant positive change compared to a few years ago. But we still know that solving for it's really challenging, and providers acknowledge that they are facing a, a variety of challenges in trying to effectively execute on their identity management efforts. So if you take a look at this chart, you can see that. Um, more than two-thirds report challenges solving for everything from determining who has regular access rights to establishing audit trails or monitoring user attributes and synthesizing disparate data sources. So does the fact that most of these providers report such a broad range of identity management challenges uh, surprise you at all, Gianni? Uh, unfortunately not, and this is not really unique to healthcare. I think this is just a, a reality of of this market and this space and this, this area of focus. Um, you know, I will say that we have seen financial services as, as a vertical, given that the, they have been, in, in more traditional senses, highly focused on this, and they've, they've done a pretty good job of associating their, their top-line um, growth to some of these initiatives, be able to make some inroads here. But even even in that market, um, we still see that it's it's, it's a challenge, right? Um, the ability to automate IT processes is, has been a primary driver. But as we have expanded the scope and what we've already discussed around the need to to go beyond IT and to start to leverage this as a way to better understand the risks associated with access. All of these things come to the fore, and we haven't traditionally done a great job here. So that's where um, we come in, um, and tools that are focused on early management come in to help uh, help healthcare providers sort of start to really address some of these challenges. But it's not just the tooling, right? It's also a cultural shift of making sure that uh, this data is 
is focused on and, and it becomes important internally. And obviously we're seeing that happen, as we've just talked about. Now I think it's a, it's, we're at the point where people are realizing it. Now we need to get through that uh, implementation process and that enablement and that general cultural shift that has to occur. And culture shifts take time. Right? They're, they're not quick in nature. So I, I'm hoping that we'll start to see some inroads over the next uh, two to three years on this side, on, on some of these things. Yeah, absolutely. And you bring up an interesting um, point about the, you know, the comparisons to other highly regulated verticals like, um, like financial services and whatnot. And it makes me wonder, are there any, any verticals that you think are uh, solving for some of those key challenges particularly well that maybe healthcare could, uh, could learn from or any that you are seeing sort of that cultural shift happen more rapidly? I think I'll, I'll lean on financial services again, and, and to a certain degree also sort of the energy sector. Um, I think as as two verticals, I think they've done a, a pretty impressive job of focusing on this problem and really trying to identify uh, the right ways to leverage technology to solve this problem. There also tend to be organizations as well, once again, coming back to the whole scale challenge, a lot of those organizations that we work with within those verticals are large by nature, and so they are almost don't have a choice. They have to solve this problem, otherwise they just incur huge operational costs and, and, and huge risks to the organization if they don't get it under control. I think the main area I've seen recently in, is within the financial services vector has been a, a laser focus on what we're going to discuss today around how do, we, how do they internally start to leverage uh, machine learning and AI. A lot of those financial institutions have already centers of excellence for different reasons, not necessarily cybersecurity, where they've been invested in sort of data scientists and that type of uh, skill set to solve, you know, very specific problems around looking at obviously credit card fraud and um, how they can look for really interesting financial um, opportunities. And so they leverage it more on the top line, but obviously that, that type of thinking starts to culturally start to seep into other areas of the business. And so that isn't surprising that those organizations see their cybersecurity teams start to try to leverage those teams in certain ways. So when we look at, for example, monitoring user attributes and behavior and access patterns to identify risks and, and, abnorm and uh, um, abnormalities, I think that's a, a, a specific area where we've, we've done a lot of partnering with the financial services sector to start to focus on that um, as, an, as an area of uh, ripe for improvement. Yeah, which I think sets us up really well for, the, for this next uh, series of data points, which is just simply isolating some of those top challenges that we just looked at. So if you just look at the top four, um, you see that hospitals and health systems are most often challenged by, you know, synthesizing disparate historical and real-time identity data, um, by operationalizing their identity analytics, by monitoring user attributes and behaviors to identify risk, and finally, by monitoring workload fatigue or reducing the amount of time they are spending performing access reviews. So all of these top challenges are related to making use of identity data to drive decisions. And you just touched on this a little bit, Gianni, but how do you see artificial intelligence and machine learning um, playing a role here specifically for identity management? And, or looking at that another way, where do you see some of the future opportunities? Yeah, so I think... What this articulates to me is that humans are incredibly adaptable, a lot of things, and, and we see that in, every, in, in all of our lives. And what, one of the things that we see that's common here, though, and what is fundamentally hard for humans to do is to assess a lot of data. And if you look at all of these, these drivers here, they, they really depend on the synthesizing of massive amounts of data, specifically when we talk about large organizations, whether that's historical and real-time identity data insights, identity analytics, monitoring behaviors, and, and in particular, the time spent performing access reviews. If you look at that one, you know, people spend hours looking at entitlement screens that have lots of data in them, and it's hard to necessarily pick out patterns and understand what, where the consistencies are if you're going from one page to the other. So I think that you know, what the AI brings as an opportunity is for us to help users go through this process because of the fact it can it can assess and look at huge quantities of data and really try to find out and pinpoint the specific areas that need to be focused on so that human can do what they do really well which is make good um, logical decisions based on 
what's right for the business, and they're not worrying too much about just trying to figure out what they're seeing in the data. So I think that's the big opportunity. How can we leverage ML to better inform how hospital staff make improved decisions so that they're able to not only be more efficient at what they're doing, which they're, you know, it's difficult today to do a lot of these types of activities, but they can also get the organization to be more secure and, and reduce the risk of breach. Great points, and you know, AI certainly seems like a promising layer in that identity management staff, but um, I'm curious to take a, a look for a moment at what the data tells us about what providers are doing today to address some of those challenges and maybe where AI fits into that mix now. And so you can tell from this data that the reality is that most of these hospitals and health systems are taking a number of steps to solve their identity management challenges. So that includes everything from developing policies to govern user access and monitoring um, and analyzing access behaviors. So those are steps that at least six out of 10 providers are taking today. Um, then we see about half who are um, utilizing a unified governance approach to access rights and automating permissions assignments. So you talked about that a little bit about the, you know, the, just the ability to automate, um, you know, really allowing you to scale out these efforts. And then we also see about one third who are already evaluating artificial intelligence and machine learning capabilities for identity solutions and then developing peer groups to identify risk. So, you know, the fact that a third already has AI firmly on their radar for identity management, I think is notable um, given some of the other research that we've conducted at HIMSS, which shows that only a minority of hospitals and health systems, about a quarter in fact, have one or more artificial intelligence or machine learning use cases in pilot test or production. Um, but this seems to be an area at least where you know, AI is starting to um, register as a real potential opportunity. So Gianni, given this kind of suite of approaches that people are taking to address some of their identity management um, pain points, do you, do you think that uh, providers are focusing on the right steps? Yeah, I think so. I think this, 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 um, this graphic does a really great way of, I think, representing what I would call like a maturity curve around identity management, right, if you think about it. And also percentage-wise, it, it sort of aligns pretty nicely as well. You know, logically, you have to start to understand what policies you want to govern your access. Um, ARNML can help you with sort of a bottoms-up approach, but at, certain, at a certain level, you have to do a tops-down approach to what is important to your business. And so it's not surprising that we're seeing the most, um, uh, we're seeing most healthcare organizations address that to begin with, and that's the right thing to do, right? Then from there, you can start to go and potentially uh, understanding how that policy is being enforced and, and monitoring, analyzing whether that is uh, being adhered to. Then you get into the whole governance of that. So how do we start to infuse people and process into it to make sure that those policies are adhered to? Then you want to automate that. And then really the way you gain leverage in that process, and, and one of the, the first four we've been doing for a long time, right? This is, they're not new. Where, where we really see the, the introduction of the, the ANML is really in hypercharging those first four things. So we can actually get those numbers of 62, 60, 54, 47% much higher because we can reduce the, the time it takes to start to make progress. I think a lot of the reasons why we see, um, you know, I would love to see, for example, a, a much higher number for unified governance approach to access rights, right? The fact that it's only 54% is not fantastic. And I think one of the main reasons is because it's incredibly difficult to do. And without assessing data and out with use, without using tools that we can leverage through just some basic BI in some cases, but then getting even further and leveraging AI and ML to really get to the next level is going to be a critical next step for a lot of organizations. And so I think that as we see the adoption of some of that technology, we're going to see these numbers increase over time for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And, and interestingly, for those top four things that you just mentioned, we didn't really see a lot of difference um, in the um, incidence of adoption or usage for large versus mid to small sized healthcare organizations. But I think it is important and maybe interesting to note that those larger organizations, so those are the ones with 500 or more beds, are 
twice as likely to be evaluating artificial intelligence and machine learning capabilities for identity management. They're also two times as likely to be developing peer groups to identify risk. So if you think about that, it's roughly 50% or half of those larger organizations are taking one or more of those steps versus about a quarter of their mid to small size peers. So I know we talked about this a little bit before when we looked at some of the data, you know, around larger organizations and scale, but why do you think these last two approaches are so much more broadly in use among larger hospitals and health systems? I think it really, it's, I think it's a statement of the maturity of sort of the AI and ML market as it exists today. Um, I, I think for for companies to be able to get the the benefits and the business um, ROI that they're they're seeking from an AI and ML engine, they they companies need to have a, a really good level of maturity around their data internally, and they need to have good practices in the, in relation to how they collect that, store that, and make that available within their enterprise. And I think larger organizations are just further along on that journey. And that's why I think we're seeing them um, adopt here because they're in a position to be able to leverage the technology. I, I do think that there is also opportunity though here for organizations such as CellPoint and others to do a much better job of explaining the data required and helping to find really specific areas of focus to drive business impact. I think. AI and ML is understandably being talked about in a lot of different ways, and, and it's used quite generically. And I think um, we all have to, and we're going to talk a little bit about how we'll, we leverage it a bit later, I believe. We all have to do a better job of showing here is the immediate business impact that this can drive for you, and if you do these one or two steps, here's how you can go and get that value. I think up until this point, most organizations have had to do a, a lot of that figuring out themselves because a lot of the technologies are more like toolkits that allow organizations to go and develop their own sort of AI and ML viewpoints for their own needs versus coming with a point of view. And so I, I think that's sort of what is leading to this, this disparity between sort of large and small organizations. Smaller organizations need companies such as CellPoint to provide a point of view, while larger organizations tend to have the capacity and, and sometimes have unique requirements that mean that they prefer to, to take some more responsibility themselves as they investigate some of these challenges. Yeah, fair points all, I think. Um, so thank you for that. So, you know, we've established that identity management is a key priority for most hospitals and health systems in the U.S. today, but it is a priority that comes with a number of challenges and challenges that, you know, providers are taking a variety of steps to address, um, as we just discussed, and, and certainly room for continued improvement there. So how are those efforts paying off? What, what do we see that's working well based on the data we collected? And where might there be gaps or opportunities for improvement? So when you ask the cybersecurity decision makers to rate their effectiveness at managing um, different aspects of identity, they most often acknowledge success at managing privileged access managing passwords and access requests, and documenting user access for auditing purposes. So those are the three that kind of rise to the top where we get, you know, two-thirds or more who feel that their organizations are highly effective in those three areas. Um, we had slightly fewer, but still more than half, who indicated that they're effective at the balance of the activities that we measured, things like provisioning and deprovisioning or locating and classifying sensitive data they might have stored in files. So Gianni, what do you think that these data points tell us about uh, the state of identity in healthcare today? I, I think it tells us that um, understandably healthcare providers are focusing on sort of the challenges that they're faced day to day. and. And, and if you look at these, they're, they're predominantly the transactional style engagements, right? They are managing passwords and access codes, a very transactional um, type of an, um, engagement where, you know, there is an absolute need and a necessity to have um, someone have certain access. I actually have a really interesting story in relation to my wife. She's a nurse and she just joined a new hospital and she took a week and a half to get some access that she needed. And, 
And then as soon as she got her access, she was unable to uh, reset her password for about another two days while she waited on some IT staff at the, at the provider. That's, that's massive loss of um, you know, just productivity. And so when, you, when you're faced with those challenges, I think it's not surprising that health, um, hospitals and pretty much any industry is going to go and focus on sort of that managing password and access risk component. But they also want to do that, um, and, and the, the smart and savvy um, providers are doing this. They, they understand that the implication of that means that you can't just solve for ease of use. You have to do it in a secure way, and that's where I think the managing of privilege access and documenting this process becomes critical. And when we look at you know, some, an example of how we try to simplify this at SailPoint, you know, we really do try to make this easy on, um, on hospital teams and staff and, and the IT team fundamentally. What we want to do is remove the need for the IT team to be in the way. So that, for example, my wife, instead of her having to submit a ticket, wait for it to be updated over a period of days, she simply has an interface where she can log in day one, and this should be the primary thing that she gets provision once she joins the organization. And then if she doesn't have something she needs, she can very quickly go and request that based on uh, what her manager indicates that she needs. And we try to make that as simple and as, and as effective as possible without any real, real IT jargon. Um, and it's a very straightforward process for for um, her to go and get that access very quickly. On the flip side as well, once she has access and she's having issues with addressing passwords, one of the great things that some, some technologies like Cellpoint can provide is the ability to manage those passwords in more effective ways versus having to go to each application one by one. And so what a lot of applications do and what a lot of IT organizations do is they use a lot of shared um, authentication services such as Active Directory Sync and uh, LDAP Syncs as well. And so a lot of applications may all use the same password as an example. And so we can provide the facility for users themselves to manage this process, once again, without the need to engage with, um, with, uh, with the IT, which tends to just bog things down. So I think when you look at that list, it's, it's unsurprising, right? It's, it's where most of the pain is felt for most organizations, and it's very IT operation centric. But this also provides you with a lens of audit and transactional visibility that also helps record this in a much better way than what you would traditionally get in just a bunch of IT tickets um, that are much harder to query and understand when and what was done by who. Uh, and obviously, this is all audited for uh, security purposes. Well, those are some great examples of how we are or how you, you know, you can start to address some of those key priorities. And but there are also some areas on the flip side where we're seeing a number of gaps or areas of opportunity for providers to, to do better. Um, and those include things like ensuring uh, appropriate separation of duty, periodic review of access rights, and monitoring access behaviors. So, these are areas where we had fewer than half who told us that they're, you know, either only somewhat effective or not effective in those areas of identity management. So they're kind of coming up at the bottom of the list. Um, what do you think that they can do specifically, Gianni, to improve their effectiveness in, in those areas of identity management? Yeah, so I think this is, this is where um, I come back to my point I made earlier, which is if you look at these, challenges, it's not surprising to me that this is where we're seeing the gap, right? Because all of these require a certain level of data, um, data analysis to do effectively and or without data analysis requires a lot of hours of, of time. It's very difficult to monitor access behavior without spending lots of time with humans. Uh, so you need to do a much better job of data analysis. Uh, Review and access rights periodically very time consuming and intensive and there's a lot of data involved. Ensuring appropriate separation of duty is a very challenging problem, not so much from a data perspective, but understanding the underlying access that someone has and how that manifests into business language. And so, you know, I think it's 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 just it's a combination of it's hard and requires a lot of time and effort. And the traditional ways of solving these problems have not always uh, they've been able to get us to a certain area, but everyone always feels like they could be doing more. And so I think that's why we're sort of seeing this uh, come to fruition from a GAPS perspective. You know, we as, a, as an organization try, are, are working our hardest to solve in particular that 
that point about periodic reviews. You know, we as an organization have helped organizations move from very manual uh, spreadsheet-driven processes to a much more automated process, which allows for you know, access to be removed in real time as these decisions are being made, and it'd be a much more straightforward process. But we know that we can go even further than that, which is how do we start to help the reviewer go through this process more effectively? And one way that we do that is through providing concrete recommendations to the user. Um, but over time, and as there's more trust in our ability to drive um, good outputs from recommendations using AI and ML, we want to automate that so we can actually get to just focusing on the outliers as well. And so we can do this both from a, a certification perspective of, of annual periodic reviews to also as new access is being granted, providing that visibility to a potential approver. And like I said, over time, we can just start to automate these processes in areas where there is low risk, but in areas where there is high risk, we can provide more context. So this is just a, an area where I think it's right for adoption of new ways of thinking to change the way that um, those those problems are addressed, because uh, I think there's there's some really interesting, compelling ways to solve it. Yeah, and I, I think those are some really good examples um, of you know of how you might start solving and closing the gap on some of those challenges. Um, and certainly, you started to introduce the you know uh, value for some of those AI enabled solutions as well. So so let's take a look at how cybersecurity influencers and decision makers feel about the potential of leveraging AI to really solve their most pressing identity challenges. And what we see is uh, some pretty widespread um, kind of perception that AI-enabled identity solutions can deliver significant or moderate value pretty much to all of the outcomes we measured. It was about eight out of 10 who fell into that orange section of the bar. So everything from you know, recognizing the value of AI and machine learning to improve user access uh, workflow at the bottom bar list here, all the way up to accelerating time to value, uh, maintaining regulatory compliance, uh, compliance, or improving overall security posture. So, um, you know, attitudinally, we're seeing um, some traction there, and it seems to signal that those cybersecurity stakeholders see great promise in AI-enabled identity. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about SailPoint's vision for that, Gianni, and, and what outcomes you think could benefit most from AI? Yeah, so, so at SailPoint, we, we, we are the first company really to fully embrace the concept of um, moving into a new world of identity and, and we fundamentally think it's all about becoming predictive like how do we make identity predictive and, and move away from a more reactive state and so the way that we communicate our strategy is sort of around four key tenants of our platform it's about how do we do a better job of helping uh, hospitals or whoever uses our technology anticipate user needs through the use of some of our patented ML approaches around how do we model access and how do we remote mine and create a point of view around what access should look like. Coming back to how do you define your business policies, we think there's some, we, think, we believe there's a way to leverage your data to help you through that process and get you started, which has always been a challenge. And so one of the ways that I can show you sort of that, that output is represented here in some of the technology that we have is providing that, that footprint of here is a point of view. This is the customer didn't have to do anything other than provide us with their, their account information, and we can start providing a view around what their organization can look like and who are the people represented here based on the strength of an entitlement similarity and the number of entitlements that need to be represented within a group. So that's sort of the first pillar. The second is all about how do we spot risky behaviors. So leveraging behavior analysis and understanding how things may be changing within the environment to see where we focus more on um, those edgy situations versus just trying to review everything. You know, the current pattern of of um, review is very much a an all or nothing approach. And I think there are uh, is way more compelling ways where we can start to highlight areas of risk based on things like usage or maybe native change where access has been changed within the application and not through the governance program as real key areas to to focus uh, controls around. The next is 
how do we start to adapt and automate security policies? I, I sort of touched on this a little bit prior. You know, how do we leverage recommendations and the analysis that we do to actually automate processes that exist today? So instead of having to have a, a manager approve every access item or uh, the application owner have to approve certain things, why can't we just automate that based on how common that access is within an, an individual's peer group or um, the level of risk associated with that to entitlement and, and adapt it based on who the individual is versus having a car launch approach to everything. And then last, we, we really want to figure out, we, we know that this only works if there is an element of um, transparency and control that, that organizations have over this. And so there always needs to be the ability to, to track what is happening at all times and, and see what made the change and, and, and what was some of the rationale behind it. And so we spend a lot of time focusing on how we translate a lot of the, the outputs that we provide into to understandable chunks so that when we when we go for when customers go for an audit process and they have to validate their controls, they have everything that they need to very quickly provide that information to their auditors and, and go through that process. So that's sort of the way that we we think about identity and how we think it's going to evolve and continue to evolve over the next um, three to five years into a much more predictive approach. Yeah, it's really interesting, and it certainly, uh, you know, demonstrates the value that, or the benefit that you get from infusing your identity solutions with some AI capabilities. So thank you. That's really a really great kind of real-life example. But, you know, like most, most new approaches, there are some concerns that are going to need to be addressed to really ensure um, adoption is accelerated across these organizations, and, and AI-enabled identity is no exception there. So the most widespread um, concern, which was cited by six out of 10 respondents um, with respect to using AI-enabled identity solutions are concerns regarding um, hyped and unrealistic expectations for artificial intelligence in this space and unproven or still developing technology solutions and tools, right? So needing to really understand, you know, what, what, what should we realistically expect and educating and developing confidence in the tool sets that are out there. Um, if you add to that, more than half are worried about the accuracy and reliability of algorithms. For, for example, the risk of introducing bias into those algorithms. And 45% are concerned about data security and privacy. So those are all important concerns and, and concerns that certainly mirror some of the broader market concerns about AI use cases in healthcare overall, so not just with respect to identity management, but these are concerns we often see cited with respect to using any AI-enabled solution in healthcare. Um, I think notably, far fewer, it was only about a third at the bottom of this list, are worried about siloed data um, or a lack of interoperability or even having insufficient data sets to enable meaningful machine learning. So Gianni, what do you make of these concerns overall? Yeah, so my first reaction, I'm gonna split this into two. I'm gonna talk a little bit about that data piece you just mentioned, but holistically as a product person, when I see a list like this, I just see it as like my mandate to go and address these concerns, right? Like if, if I can't solve this, then I don't have something that's viable. And so I, have, I look at all of these concerns and I say, we have to do a better job to uh, make sure that the hype is realized, right? Like we have to do a better job of making sure that our solutions um, are developed in a way where they're, that they're proven and that we have results that we can showcase to, to remove that fear. Um, we, we have to build um, products that are backed by patents and valid data points to, to prove the accuracy and the reliability of our algorithms. So this is just like a brilliant list for me as a product person just say, this is the data I need. These are the concerns that I need to go and address to make people feel comfortable with the idea of leveraging the technology to help solve their problems. And I just want to go and attack them. Uh, I am surprised, though, about the last three, um, uh, just given my experience, to be quite honest. It's, it's, it's always the most painful part of um, any data-based data -based product is just making sure that the data that is made available is, is, is available. Um, and so... Uh, what I think this really represents is a growing understanding within organizations that while this has traditionally been problematic, 
they know that it's a challenge that they have to just they have to figure out and they have to go and address. And so, while I think that, that when they look at it in comparison, there's still a lot of um, you know they're still worried about whether A and ML is really going to solve their problem, which is why I think it's coming out as a high concern. I think they know that that there's no question that data quality, insufficient data, and siloed data is a problem. And as an organization, they've probably already made the commitment to looking to solve that problem over time, which is probably, I think, why it's manifesting this way. But I can say that from experience, you know, this is still very much at the fore of where we spend a lot of time with customers and helping them uh, through the process so that we can get to really proving out uh, that the, the technology works and that, that the approach can really yield meaningful results. Very valid points, I think. So thank you for that. So we, we've covered a lot of ground in a fairly short amount of time today, and, and I want to thank you, Gianni, for all of your insights into the topic. And, and before we turn this back to Bill for questions from the audience, I just want to leave everyone with a brief recap of what we discussed today and, and then give Gianni an opportunity for some final thoughts again before we go to questions. But I think the first key takeaway is that, you know, I think we've established that cybersecurity stakeholders recognize that they face a variety of identity management challenges, and many of them um, may be able to be addressed um, through AI-enabled capabilities. Second, I think we're seeing that larger hospitals and health systems seem to be focusing on key areas of identity that can have equal, if not greater, benefit for mid- and small-sized organizations. So we need to make sure that um, those organizations are not overlooking uh, the value from introducing some of this thinking. I think third is we look at areas of competencies related to identity management. Um, you know, we see that there are some gaps that could be filled um, by using identity solutions with, you know, artificial intelligence and machine learning capabilities. And then finally, you know, while there's significant perceived value in infusing AI into identity governance, there definitely are some concerns. And I think to your point, Johnny, kind of understanding how AI within identity works um, can help to reduce or address some of those concerns going forward. So any final thoughts from you, Gianni? No, just uh, the, main, the main thought that I had was, you know, the, the, we, are, we are at a, a, a transition point, I think, across all industries, not just the identity management and cybersecurity space around a new wave of technology. I, I see this stepping stone in a similar way to sort of the cloud evolution that, that occurred 15, 20 years ago in, in, in IT, where I think we are going to see a wave of, of technology that changes the game. And I think for cybersecurity in particular, it's very needed. And, and as a company, I'm, I, you know, Cellpoint, I'm, I'm thrilled to work for an organization that's recognized that. And, and we are dedicated and committed to, to solving um, these challenges that have been around for a long time with this wave of technology. We, we fundamentally believe that it really aligns very well, as we've already discussed. And this is something that hopefully um, a lot of the, the people that are listening in uh, can relate to and they're excited about the potential opportunity to actually start solving these problems at scale uh, and in a cost-effective way that has always been a challenge in the past. Definitely. Well, thank you, Gianni. Thank you very much, and thank you to SailPoint for sponsoring the research. And with that, I'm going to turn it back to you, Bill, to open it up to questions from the audience. Thank you both for a wonderful presentation. I want to first remind everyone that you can continue to submit questions using the Ask a Question panel on your screen. So, for our first question, as we have a tight staff with limited resources, how difficult is it to maintain machine learning technology? What resources will it require? So I think that will depend on the technology that you're adopting. Um, you know, from, from a cell point perspective, our, uh, um, our AI and ML technology is, is built and, and deployed from the cloud. So we make it very easy for um, users of our technology to not have to worry about the, the infrastructure upkeep and the management of that. It's all delivered from our multi-tenant SaaS environment. So there isn't any sort of infrastructure requirements on organizations, which obviously helps a lot when you have a tight staff. You don't have to worry about managing 
rather complex Hadoop ecosystems and huge data repositories. So that's one benefit from leveraging a technology and art advisor that most people that want to look into NML should obviously be leveraging the power of the cloud because just the economies of scale that it provides really is what is required to make this a cost-effective solution versus having to procure pretty expensive hardware on-premise. Um, secondly, I think that maintaining the machine models itself is all dependent on the quality of data, and so a lot of it comes down to just having good internal processes to sort of the last point that we had um, in, the, in the slide around your data silos and having a lot more clarity around that. And so a combination of picking the right technologies and, and deploying it in the right way to make the burden of managing the system much more straightforward on you, and then a laser focus on data quality and ultimately the outcomes that you want to drive so you don't go with a, a huge broad approach and you focus in on what are the key drivers that you want to have, like reduction in access certification fatigue, or I want to reduce the amount of time it takes for requests to be provisioned. You know, getting laser focused so the machine learning model can really focus and help you in those areas are going to be critical to success. Great. Our next question. Any suggestions for how to get buy-in from the board or others who may be leery of this technology? You know, I think it comes down to a, a simple equation of doing a good job of um, explaining the value that is going to be yielded from the result. A lot of our customers have done pretty impressive work. I can't go into specifics, but you know, they've done a pretty good job of explaining what the cost of a request is, what the cost of a certification campaign is on a per individual level, and to the point where as we reduce down that time from hours and days to minutes, potentially, the, 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 the savings incurred are significant, and it's a great way to sort of demonstrate that buy-in. Alternatively, um, when you start to look at all of the breaches and all of the, the fines that are now coming out because of things like GDPR and other types of regulations, there's another amazing, compelling um, way in which you can go and have a conversation with the board around you know, we have to do a better job of protect, protecting data, and one of the core cool ways you do that is through how and what individual employees have access to. And that's another way you can have that discussion That's sort of the, the security level as more and more boards across uh, enterprises have um, security as a, as a mandate and a discussion point. So they're sort of the two vectors through which I see most of our successful customers attack this with their boards. Okay, we have another question. While we see the value in AI, particularly with identity governance, is this something that can be done now, or is it more conceptual? It absolutely can be done now. Um, we absolutely have capabilities today in the market that leverages machine learning to, to do same governance. We saw one of the applications of it um, from a recommendation perspective and then also from an access modeling perspective. But it's, we're certainly not done. There's a lot more that will be happening as the as the market continues to mature and evolve, and in particular, as we at Cellpoint continue to um, look to learn with our customers and find new opportunities. So, yes, uh, it's not conceptual at this point. There is definite valid ways in which machine learning can help organizations today around identity governance, and there will be more in the future that we'll continue to expand upon as as we learn and as we find new and interesting opportunities. Okay, at this time we have to wrap up. Thank you Gianni and Janet for such a wonderful presentation. I would like to invite our audience to complete the evaluation at the conclusion of today's event and share your thoughts with us. As a reminder, today's session will be available on demand for one year through the HIMSS Learning Center. Have a great day everyone.